Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. And we're now beginning the second session on the soul of Hajj. A series which focuses on the essence of Hajj. We've made something of a comparison between the body and the soul. Of course, one can't exist without the other. In the sense, the body and the soul is what makes up the human being. Although when the body dies, the soul lives on. <clears throat> but that the soul is obviously the higher and most important part. It's not the visible part. The rituals and the rites of Hajj represent the body. They're necessary, they've been prescribed. But the goal is really the soul. So, in our previous session, we looked at Hajj in a general perspective, in terms of Allah making it obligatory on all of the believers, whether they're able to do it or not, while at the same time, leaving a variety of windows open for them through which they could still attain the same blessings that one would who did the actual Hajj. We spoke about the ultimate goal being the remembrance of Allah and that the more immediate tangible goal, that of purification from sin and the reward of paradise, both of which may be attained through other means, through other channels, obviously channels of Islamic righteous deeds. We're now going to complete our look at the general aspects of Hajj that we should keep in mind to make sure that we come out of Hajj having achieved these characteristics. Hajj is character building. Prophet Muhammad had said, <clears throat> I was only sent to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits. So Islam and all of its pillars are focused on character, moral character, building the correct human moral character with regards to Allah, with regards to other human beings, and with regards to the world in which we function. So there is moral behavior in relationship to Allah. To worship Him alone is morally correct. To worship others along with Him or besides Him is morally incorrect. Similarly, with other human beings, human society, to steal, to cheat, these are morally incorrect. To be honest and to be fair, these are morally correct. And then the world in which we live, a world which Allah has submitted to us, whether the air, the sea, or the land, we extract from the land fruit, food, from the sea, food, we use it for transportation, from the air, we breathe, we benefit. It's morally correct to look after these 
or this created world in which we live. And it's morally incorrect to pollute it, to corrupt it, to destroy it. So Prophet Muhammad had said that if the last hour comes and any one of you has a seedling in his hand, plant it. Planting trees is a righteous deed for which we are rewarded. It's morally correct. So when we go back and we look at the various pillars of Islam, it is important for us to look at the moral perspective. What are, what are the character traits that each and every one of these pillars of Islam invite us to? In the case of Hajj, because that's what we're looking at, there are two major traits, and there are many, because we said Hajj already encompasses everything, all of the other pillars. But there are two unique uh, traits. One is the development of the universalist or universalistic character. A human being who has a universalist view, an international view. He is not or she is not restricted by nation, tribe, clan, etc. They look at all other human beings as a part and parcel of Allah's creation. From that overall group of humankind, we have a smaller group, those who have believed, who have accepted God into their hearts, those who have believed truly, as opposed to those who merely believe, because of course there are many who believe, but what they believe in is incorrect. So those who have the correct belief, in other words, they're believing in the true God, they represent within the overall body a brotherhood, sisterhood about which Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً The believers, true believers, are one brotherhood. So Hajj brings Muslims from all over the world and brings them together in a gathering which they would not normally experience. We know that Islam is communal. It has uh, implications in human society. It affects, it governs, it directs human society. So our prayers especially for the males who are outside of the home, are supposed to be in the mosque. That gives us a sense of immediate community. Immediate community. We know the people who are our neighbors from our neighborhood. We are familiar with them. We meet them in the mosque in the early morning till late at night. Those meetings helps us, builds bonds between us, which helps us to be able to help others and to be helped by others. That regular communal gathering. Then we have the Eids. Or oh, before that we have Juma. Once a week, we have the Friday congregational prayer. The midday prayer is prayed in congregation by people from a wider uh, community. Rather than a small 
uh, subdivision, we now go to the, uh, you could say, district. So all these people from the various subdivisions, they pray in one mosque of that district. So then it also helps to build communal bonds with the wider community. Then Eid. Eid, twice a year, the community gathers again. Not only of the subdivisions within a district, but the districts. All of the districts of that area, they come and pray in one place. Again, more networking, contact, awareness. Because when you see your Muslim brother or sister and they're having difficulty in their lives, etc., it, it will be evident on their faces how they carry themselves, body language, these types of things. Then we reach out. How are you? What's happening? What's the problems? You know, try to help each other. And then we have the Hajj. We're not talking about many districts and a country. We're talking about the whole world. Muslims are brought together. And we get to see people not only from other areas of our country or the area of the earth where we are, but people who are coming from other backgrounds all together. And they're all believers. This reinforces this brotherhood of Muslims coming from all backgrounds, all cultures from around the world. It reinforces that basic concept that we have that there is only one God who created only one human race. Though people tell us there are different races, human races, they've given them names even. Mongoloid for people of the Far East. Caucasoid for people of the northern parts of Europe, etc. Negroid, people from Africa, etc. And then there are other people in between. Those are the main three. But the reality is, is that these are concocted. These are not true differences any more than the Persian cat is different from you know, an alley cat. Yeah, they, some, is, some are fluffier than others, different colors, etc., but they're cats. Similarly, human beings may come in different colors, sizes, shapes, but they're human beings. One human race. And God prescribed for them one religion. He didn't prescribe for them a bunch of religions, which would then be the source of confusion, people squabbling amongst themselves. No, these many religions were created by human beings. They created these different religions. God only prescribed one religion. So there's one God who created one human race who have a single need. It's the same. Whether it was 10,000 years ago, a million years ago, or a million years hence, human beings are human beings. Their needs are the same. Their concerns are the same. So there was one religion. Hajj reinforces that oneness. We as human beings are one nation of human beings. So, as a Muslim, we don't 
call to or invite or encourage any of the symbols of nationalism, tribalism, etc. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had said, Man da'a ila al-asabiyya falaysa minna. Whoever invites or calls people to nationalism or tribalism is not of us. It is not the Islamic way. Our concern is about faith. As Allah said, Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. The most noble of you in the sight of Allah are those who fear Him the most. Those who are most conscious of Him. This is where true superiority lies. Everything else is what Allah has given us and there is no superiority in it. So the Hajj personality is one which is open-minded. It is free from the tribalistic or nationalistic ways of thinking. The second character, character trait which Hajj calls to, and we have spoken about it actually earlier, some degree, is patient. The Hajj character has to be a patient one. Because of the nature of the Hajj, which puts people together under very tight circumstances, mentally, physically, emotionally, stressing circumstances. If one isn't patient, there's no way to get through Hajj. Hajj is about patience. Critical. Without it, there's no way to achieve its goals. The question is, some people say, well, I was born impatient. You know, there's some people, they're born, they're just like patient kind of people. They can take a lot. But most of us, many of us, we're impatient. The least little thing happens, we're flying off the handle. So what do we do? How, do we be, how can we be patient? How can we get through Hajj patiently? Well, Prophet Muhammad had said, "May yatasabbar yusabbirhu Allah." Whoever pretends to be patient, seeking patience, Allah will give him or her patience. So, though you might be impatient inside, externally pretend to be patient. This is what you have to do. You want to achieve it? Then you pretend to be patient. Some people say this is hypocritical. Why? You're not really patient. You're just putting on a false front. But the Prophet Sallallahu had said, if you do that, sincerely, Allah will give you patience. So, through the Hajj, you keep a smile on your face as they step on your toes and elbow you and hurt you in one way or another. You just keep that smile on your face knowing that it's all purification, it's all reward and inshallah, Allah will give us patience. And we know in Surah Al-Asr, the chapter by time, where Allah describes the state of humankind as being one of loss. Except for those who believe and do righteous deeds and invite each other, encourage each other to be truthful and encourage each other to be patient.
that this is one of the keys for success in life. And that's why developing patience out of Hajj, if we don't get anything else out of it, at least we need to come out with patience. Because patience is critical for success in this life. Because no matter what a person's state may be, what circumstances they've been blessed with, life is up and down. There are good times, there are bad times. Everybody faces them. One way or another. One time or another. And the only way that we're able to get through them is if we're patient. Because the trials will come. In the Quran saying, Allah says, I will try and test you with fear, loss of life, wealth, property. And in the end he said, Give glad tidings to those who are patient. But glad tidings of what? Of paradise. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُسِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Those who when calamity strikes them, calamity must strike sometime, many times, they say, indeed we belong to Allah and to Him we must return. We know it is all from Allah anyway. We have to be patient with it. If we're patient with it, we benefit from it. If we're not, it's only a punishment for us. So, those represent the two major characteristics that we should keep uppermost in our minds as we are working our way through Hajj. Now, we'll start to look at the elements of Hajj and Umrah. The most basic elements. Rites and rituals, which when put all together, interacting, produce the Hajj. The first and most basic element is that of Ihram. Ihram. And ihram is basically the intention for umrah or hajj. Umrah being the lesser pilgrimage, hajj being the major pilgrimage. It's not the actual garments that people wear. The two cloths, or what we now use as towels, mainly in many, many cases, for men... And whatever garment the women wear, theirs is not restricted. Some countries people will wear white, somehow thinking that it, it's required. Uh, even the haram garments of men, though we normally wear white, to wear any other color is also acceptable. But if you went there with a green haram, people would be looking at you funny. You know, and just to avoid having everybody looking at you and questioning why, it's easier just to wear white. Huh? But um, it's not the garment itself. It is the intention. Because if the time came, place was arrived at, where you had to enter into the state of ihram, and all you had were the clothes on your back, you didn't have the two sheets, you had a shirt, you had pants. That becomes your ihram. If that's all you have. Though now, I mean, you know you're not supposed to wear a shirt and pants. Right? But, if that's all you had, then that's what you wear. You don't go in your underwear. You still wear your shirt and pants. You're excused because you don't have an option. So the ihram, the two towels, these outside of hajj 
they have no significance. They are really only reducing us to the common denominator. The most basic way by which we can cover our aura, some protection with the upper garment, two sheets of cloth which elsewhere is used for burying us. It's the coffin, the shroud with which we bury ourselves. So that's how we're going to leave the world. We are reducing ourselves in the state of ihram to this most basic state. One in which we are not allowed to trim our hair and fingernails, use perfume, etc. We're going right down to basics. So, we should understand that the goal of this state of ihram is really fundamentally to bring us humbly before Allah. It is a preparation for the rites of Hajj. These rites have to be done humbly. If we're doing it in a proud and puffed up kind of way, then we cannot achieve the goals of Hajj. The garments we're not allowed, we're not allowed to wear are the unstitched garments. Or sorry, the stitched garments. Our garments should just not be stitched. Some people go to extremes with the issue of stitching. They say even your shoes shouldn't have stitching in it. No, no, no. This is nonsense. The stitched garment means it's something which is stitched like this. It's made into a sleeve. That's what they mean by the stitched garments and the unstitched garment. The other ihram that we have, if you made a little pocket just to keep your valuables, it's okay. It's not a stitched garment. Now, the ihram, first and foremost, has a physical level. On the physical level, we take a ghusl, a ritual bath. And in that ritual bath, because we're not just taking a regular bath, we just go and take a shower. No, we're taking a ritual bath. In it, we take water in our mouths, nostrils. We make wudu along with it. And in the making of wudu, we are reflecting, as we make wudu, in the purifying process of wudu, where Prophet ﷺ it says when one makes wudu, one's sins drops from his or her body with the drops of water from the body. So wudu is a spiritual cleansing while or cloaked by an external physical cleansing. But the inner spiritual cleansing is more critical, more important. It's putting us into a mindset. So before we put on the cloths and make the intentions, then we prepare ourselves physically. We clip our fingernails, trim our hair, shaving underarms, private areas. Men put on perfume, oils, whatever. And women should avoid the niqab, face veil and gloves. And on this physical level, we have to avoid, as we are entering into a haram, any 
sexual relations or preliminaries which may lead to them. On a psychological level, we are obliged to give up argumentation, fighting, coarse language, outbursts of anger, patiently. This requires patience. So we have a psychological level of ihram, which involves patience, as well as modesty. We have to avoid lewd behavior like staring lustfully at the opposite sex, exploiting opportunities to be in their midst. Of course, people get crushed together. Some people uh, use this opportunity to have physical contact with females which they wouldn't normally have. I mean, all of this is corruption. So on the psychological level, emotional level, we have to pull ourselves back. So even if you are caught in a crowd, wild to off, or you know, where the people get crushed together, a female is pushed next to you or whatever, you know, you're in contact with females, which normally, Islamically, you're not supposed to be. This is something beyond your control. Uh, you have to have your head somewhere else. Otherwise, you can corrupt your own hajj, for males particularly. Women don't have as much problems with this as men tend to. And then on the spiritual level, on the spiritual level, when one puts on this common dress, which levels everybody, no distinctions between the other, in general, though of course those who are doing five-star hajjahs have five-star ihrams, right? top, cotton, whereas the other people have cheap made in China stuff, you know. But externally, it looks the same. Right? Externally, basically, we're all looking the same. So, this, if one reflects, should humble us. That bring us down to the level that we understand that really there is no difference between us in the end. What Allah has given us and hasn't given others or given others and hasn't given us, these are all a part and parcel of the tests of this life. But in the end, we come in the same way, naked, and we go out the same way, virtually naked. We can't take anything of this world with us when we leave, and we don't bring anything into this world when we come. We're all the same. So, this common denominator of nakedness in the Hajj should help us to realize who we are and what our position should be before Allah. We have to be sincere. To be able to realize this, there has to be sincerity in this process of ihram. And we also have to be prepared to obey Allah's commandment and to submit to his instructions by giving up those things that we normally have accessible to us the trappings of this life which give a position of superiority of some over others. We can buy more expensive this, that and the other. In Hajj, we are reduced. So, we should become more humble. We can say in fact that the main characteristic of Ihram is humility. That is the main moral characteristic that we should have. And truly, uh, Prophet Muhammad had said, Man tawada alillah rafa'ah. Whoever is humble for the sake of Allah, Allah elevates him or her. 
that is the Islamic view on humility. So, when we approach the haram, that should be uppermost in our minds. Humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're giving up all of the finery that we're used to. For men, many men, because we've grown up in the habit of wearing underwear, you know, it might feel very funny, strange, because you're not allowed to wear underpants. Right? Maybe the first time in our lives that we function like this without underpants, you're walking around in public, you know. We've grown up with that. So it's another experience, sort of a, you may feel sort of semi-naked walking around. In fact, you are. And for women, you know, though they are allowed to wear jewelry socks, but not gloves, not niqab, they should keep in mind that their dress has become even more elaborate in time. That they should try to think in terms of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, their first generation of believers, how they used to dress. Because women have what they call the peacock complex. The peacock likes to spread its feathers, you know, to catch the attention of those around. Women tend to have that more so than men. They like to show their finery. That's why Allah tells them, cover up. Keep it under control. Now going to make hajj, of course, you're wearing an outer garment. You should wear an outer garment which covers up your finery anyway. But practically speaking, don't go there with your finery. You know, it's not a wedding. It's not an event. It's hajj. So go as simply as you can. Think about the wives of the Prophet وسلم, and the early female companions of the Prophet وسلم. How do you think they dressed? Simply. Try to reach that level of simplicity. The reality is that without that humbling sim simplicity, real worship can't take place. If we cannot be humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we cannot truly worship Him. So that's what the ihram is really all about. It's about laying the foundation for worship. Aisha radiallahu anha, wife of the Prophet sallallahu she asked the Prophet sallallahu on one occasion, O Messenger of Allah, Ibn Juda'an established family ties and fed the poor. Would that be of any benefit to him? Ibn Juda'an was known as a good man of the pre-Islamic times. He used to keep his family ties look after the members and things of his family and he used to feed the poor he was a good man so Aisha wondered will that benefit him on the day of judgment Prophet ﷺ had said he replied it would be of no avail to him as he never once said oh my lord pardon my sins on the day of resurrection oh my lord Pardon my sins on the day of resurrection. He never humbled himself before God. So all of the good that he did will be of no benefit to him in the life to come. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in Surah Ghafir, verse 60, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي those who are too proud to worship me will enter hell humiliated. 
So humiliation is coming anyhow. No matter how pride we may, proud we may be in this life, in the end, we will be humiliated. So better we humiliate ourselves, we humble ourselves before Allah, and so be able to worship him as he deserves to be worshipped. So the ihram helps us to overcome that pride. It is the basis for our ibadah throughout the rest of the hajj. So it must be established right at the very beginning. Humility. And since ihram is the intention itself, the intention to enter this consecrated state, wherein we don't do certain things, which are normally halal, training us, strengthening us, spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally, to be able to give up the things which are actually prohibited in life in general. This uh, state, when we're going into ihram, we have to focus on our intentions. Not on the garments, because that's what people end up doing. They're focusing on the garments. What type of garment you're going to get, how you wrap it, and you know, this is the main concern, the garments. And there are other practices which people have even associated with it. You know, the wearing two, doing two rak'at after wearing, putting on the garments, but in fact there are no two rak'at. There are no two units of prayer for a haram. If you happen to be doing so at Zohar time, you pray Zohar and then you put it on, so be it. Or you, if you happen to be in the valley where the Prophet ﷺ did it, he prayed two rak'ah there because it was a blessed valley, you can do it. But if you're doing ihram regularly anywhere else, there's no, there are no two units of prayer. So the focus then should be on sincerity of our intention in entering into the hajj. The humility is to help us to become sincere. And that is the essence of worship in general. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ They were only commanded to worship Allah, making their religion sincere for Him. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالِ بِالنِّيَاتِ Deeds are judged according to their intentions. If they are sincerely for the worship of Allah, then we are rewarded for deeds done for the worship of Allah. If we are insincere, we are doing it for any other reason, then we will not gain that reward. So the key really is having sincere intentions. How do we make our intentions sincere? That's the question. Well, Intentions can be deliberately made sincere by being conscious of the ritual veils that cover the goals of Hajj. The goals of Hajj are covered in ritual veils. And we have to go beyond those veils and get to the core. We have to search our own souls, question ourselves, try to muster up some sense of humility, shame and remorse, some element of fear that we have in our hearts for God's displeasure. And when we find enough, then we build on it with our talbiya, our verbal expression of our intention for hajj, which we should proclaim from the bottom of our souls. Talbiya is not just a sing-song. 
where we just say it, you know, ritualistically here, there, and everywhere. No. It is the expression of our intent. It should come from the core of ourselves. It should represent the statement of our sincerity. That's why in the Talbiya, when we begin declaring our intent, Allahumma labbaik umratan. O Allah, I hear your call and I'm coming for Umrah. That's Hajj with Umrah. O Allahumma labbaik hajjan. O Allah, I hear your call and I'm coming for Hajj. Those who are doing Hajj alone. This should be done according to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ when we sit down in our transport but for us, most of us are going by plane. So this is something we say when we reach what is known as the Miqat. These are the boundaries beyond which one should not enter without being in the state of Ihram. We put on the garments at home because trying to put them on in the plane in the little bathroom can be a major operation. So you put it on, the physical, external garments at home, but you don't make the intention until we reach the miqat. So there, after making the intention, then we start the process of saying, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنِّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ Here I am, O oh Allah, here I am. Here I am, you have no partner, here I am. Surely all praise, grace, and dominion is yours, and you have no partner. This is a reaffirmation of our declaration of faith, the basic declaration of faith. That basic declaration of faith is found in the expression of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhla al jannah. Whoever says there is no God worthy of worship besides Allah will enter paradise. Of course, he clarifies it on different other occasions. He said, Whoever dies knowing that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah will enter paradise. We have to know who Allah is. He also said, The person who will be most pleased with my intercession is the one who says, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, sincerely from his heart. So sincerity, knowledge, have to be there. But in the end, if that is there, then that declaration of faith puts one in paradise. So we see, the end that we're seeking from the Hajj, we said was, for the accepted Hajj was paradise. But just in the Talbiyah itself, we can attain paradise. If it is done humbly and sincerely. So as we enter into Ihram, we have to keep that focus. Sincerity of intention that we are really doing Hajj for the right reasons, what we are here to accomplish, and humility, that we enter into this process from a humble position. Humility, the foundation of worship. We cannot be proud before Allah. That pride destroys sincerity. You cannot be sincere and proud. You can be sincerely proud, yeah, sincere in your pride, but that's the wrong sincerity. Sincerely humble, this is the basis of worship. So this is what we have to keep in mind with this particular element of Hajj. Ihram, which is linked with the Talbiya, and inshallah, it's also linked with the miqat. Because, as we said, the talbiyah 
expression of intent, it doesn't take place until we have reached the Miqat. If we have gone in, landed in Jeddah, and we didn't make intention, we need to go back out. You have to go back out because Jeddah is already inside of the Miqat. You have to go back out to any of the nearby Miqats. Taif is probably the nearest one. You go to Taif and come back in again with the intention for ihram and wearing the garments. The various mawaqit, these, there are five of them which have been set. Their names, we hear them, mostly we don't remember them. Dhul Hulayfa, Dhatu Irq, Al Juhfa, Qarnul Manazil, Yalam Lam. These names, we hear them and we forget them. Mainly we're coming from Taif, we're coming from Medina. You know, these are the uh, main areas that people tend to come from. Uh, from the south, south of uh, Mecca, people coming from Yemen, uh, from uh, Mecca, sorry, south of uh, from Yemen, sorry, coming from Yemen, uh, they will come by way of what was known as Yalam Lam. These have been set, and we have to stick to them. We don't try to make excuses or uh, get fatwas, whatever, which will allow us to come inside of the miqat without being in that state. If we enter in, really, one should slaughter an animal and give it to the poor in Makkah if we have crossed those boundaries without ihram. If we are conscious of it, if it was something accidental, etc., then we can just go back out and come back in without doing a slaughter, slaughter of an animal as compensation. But this is really just to keep us focused because we're coming in to do a series of acts of worship, rites. We have to be focused on what we are coming here to do. We end up breaking the rules when we become unfocused. But if we keep this element of humility, meaning we're just trying to follow it the way we have been instructed, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, خُذُوا anni manasikakum, Take your rights of hajj from me. Try to follow his way as best as we can. The way of humility by which Allah elevates us. Humility by which we worship him. And that's why so much stress is placed on sujood. Prophet Sallallahu had said, the human being is closest to Allah when he is in sujood. When he or she is prostrating. Because this is, if you are to be humiliated and humbled, that is the most humble and humiliating position you can have. The rulers of the world, they tell people to prostrate. If they are not too strong, they say, okay, stand up. If they're stronger, they say bow. And if they're real strong, then they say prostrate. So we reserve that prostration for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is our symbol of humiliation. And that's why we come closest to Allah in that state. So this is something that we have to keep in mind with regards to ihram. But it is something we have to keep in mind with regards to life in general. Hajj is a way of life. The life known as Islam. There are no principles in, in Hajj which are not interwoven into all of the various aspects of Islam. They are all found in Hajj and they're all found outside of Hajj. Concentrated in Hajj split diverted or spread out outside of Hajj in all of the other pillars they're there. 
So we need to keep in mind as we enter into the state of ihram. That the ihram is not the garments, but the intention that we hold. That intention will not be acceptable to Allah, not benefit us, unless it comes from a humbled heart. A humbled heart. Because the act of making intention is ibadah, it's worship. And all worship requires that we are humbled before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the greatest characteristic of ihram. Keep that in mind. Humility. And if we can keep that characteristic through our hajj, it will be among the deciding factors of the success or failure of our hajj. Patience without humility can't be. Humility needs to be there if we are to be truly patient, struggle with ourselves, overcome our weaknesses, then we have to be humble. So that's as far as we're going to go in this session. And uh, some people had asked, what all are we going to cover? Well, we're going to cover the whole of Hajj. But as I said, rather than follow it in terms of the rites and rituals, we will just follow it in terms of the elements. After this, we will look at Mecca, Tawaf, Sa'i, Zamzam, prayer behind Maqam Ibrahim, shaving our head, hair or trimming our hair when we finish. Those are the elements and we will look at them individually and from the same type of perspective to see what are the principles, the character building principles, the ruh or the soul of the rituals and rites of Hajj. That's what we're looking for because it is on, in understanding the inner aspects of Hajj that we can make a Hajj acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we haven't understood the inner aspects, then we have just gone through a whole series of rituals and rites which are meaningless. They are soulless. They are without a soul. They are like a dead body should only have been buried rather than carrying it around with us the whole time. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to realize the goals of Hajj, to keep us focused on the spirit of Hajj, to humble us, to give us a sense of humility by which we can truly worship him as he alone deserves to be worshipped. Okay, we'll close our session then. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayka.